and we are live, I think. I hope at least. So, welcome everyone to another T live stream. Uh, this time, I'm going to be looking at some different types of Yixing clay. The reason for this is I got myself a new teapot, and now I have a bunch of different ones, so we can do a bit of like comparing and contrasting talk about what the different properties of those clays are, where they come from, etc. Ah, and we already have our first viewer. Welcome. Okay. Uh, I've already pre-boiled the water, I've already uh, heated up my vessel. The uh, first clay out of the three we're going to be talking about is a Hongni, so the first uh, vessel I'm going to be using is the uh, Hongni pot I've already used in a few of my other videos. In total, uh, I'm looking to talk about three types of Yixing clays today. We've got Hongni, or red clays. We've got Duanni, or uh, section clays, though there are a few different names for those. And we've got Zini, or purple clays. Uh, of course, there are many types of clays beyond just those. For instance, uh, there's stuff like Nishing clay, Janshui, or even some uh, other ones like uh, Hei Jinsha, which is a black type of clay, or the uh, Taiwanese Puryong clay. My motivation for choosing the three specific types of clays that I'm uh, going to be talking about is, like I said, that I own one from each category. So here we've got the Hongni that I'm going to be using today. Here we've got a Duanni pot that we're going to be using later. And finally, this is my newest pot, the uh, Zini. One thing I noticed while researching this topic is that the uh, knowledge about teapot clays here in the West is honestly somewhat hard to come by and often kind of difficult to categorize. So. What I hope to do is provide a basic introduction to these three clay types, along with a list of sources that will hopefully help you to do further research if you so desire. Now, this pot's been preheated, I gotta boil the water again, I gotta get the tea in, and then we'll hopefully be ready to start drinking and talking clay. Um, the tea I'm having today is the... 2018 Spring Yiwu Huangtian Gushu from King Tea Mall. I uh, chose this one because it's one of the more delicate teas I own, and <coughs> I think it is going to go uh, do a good job of showing how these particular clays work together with those teas. Like, um, especially once we get to the Duanyi pot, uh, it should taste fairly different from what this tea is going to be like in Hongni. Now, for my smallest pot, the Zini, which is around 130 milliliters, I've chosen to use 7 grams. For the second largest pot, <coughs> the Hongni, which is around 170 milliliter, I'm going to use 9.2 grams, and for my largest pot, the Duanyi, I'm going to use 13.5 grams. Now, uh, usually I don't really scale my tea amounts up that linearly. Uh, most of the time, I choose to opt for fewer but longer steeps with a roughly similar amount of tea instead because a lot of uh, teas don't benefit that much from uh, having much, much higher concentration, at least when it comes to these particular younger shangs that I enjoy. Uh, the Duanyi is 250 milliliters. It's gigantic. I bought it as, like, I think an 180 milliliter pot, but it turned out quite a bit larger. <coughs> Okay, uh, I will mute myself momentarily so I can start uh, reboiling the water. So I'll be back in a moment.
Okay. Uh, I'm doing the rinse now, so uh, you can take a look at that here. Bring it in. As is custom, of course, we do not drink the rinse. Just uh, showing you the color here real quick. Already looks, uh, looks quite nice. And now, in just a moment, we are going to do our first steep. Okay, so uh, while this tea is steeping, uh, another thing of note regarding Yixing clays is that since many of the original Yixing mines have gone dry, clays nowadays can come from like all over China. They're often blended in various ways in an attempt to reproduce the characteristics of these original clays. So one important thing to keep in mind when buying pots that are labelled as certain clay types is that there is a significant risk of, for instance, dyes being added to the clay to make them look closer to the original. These dyes can not just affect the flavour of your tea, some of them can even be toxic. Because of this, I recommend trying to find someone with expertise in the field when you're trying to buy a good teapot. If you're going out yourself, then uh, always try to inspect the pots, and when you inspect those pots, smell the inside of the pot to check for, let's say, any unusual odours, since those might stem from dyes. A bit of like an earthy smell is often usual, it is clay after all, but uh, other odours are not as, let's say, wanted. And you should be especially worried of any like big name offers that come at an unusually low price. Certain types of clay are really rare and expensive, or for instance they're expensive because they're hard to work with. So if you find a really cheap one that's supposedly made of like really special clay or done with amazing craftsmanship, then uh, be cautious. Oh, only 5.2 grams. That's unfortunate. I do think this tea works well with a slightly higher ratio than usual. So, for this one, I usually do 10 grams in this Hongli pot now instead of 9.2. But since I wanted to scale the ratios, I'm doing things a bit differently today. Alright. And here we have the first steep in the Hongli pot. Now, before I get into describing uh, how the teas taste and whatnot, uh, there's one thing I want to make clear. Rather than thinking about which clay is good for which type of tea, I think the better way to approach this question is, how does a particular type of clay tend to affect tea? Framing it this way, allows us to move away from the notion that certain teas need to be paired with certain clays, and we can instead look at how we can use a certain type of clay to change any particular tea in the way we want to change it. Of course, this will indirectly lead to certain types of clay being considered more suitable for certain tea types, but it will help us keep an open mind towards trying out combinations that others might consider unusual or questionable. And now, with this in mind, I'm mainly going to be talking about the effects these types of clay have on tea without giving specific pairing recommendations. Okay, this should be ready to drink now, so let's see what it's like. Mmm.
Smells good. Pretty like floral. There's a bunch of honey in there. And of course the usual like spicy-ish, herbish type notes you get in younger Shang. <coughs> Fairly similar taste wise, like you've got some honey sweetness, it's got decent viscosity. Fairly flo uh, floral overall. There is a bit of bitterness to this here, which uh, does taste sort of greenish, maybe. I mean, it's still a young tea after all. Yeah. yeah, now that we've had a bit to drink, let's get into our first big group of clay. The red clay is also called Hongni. The term Hongni itself is a bit difficult here because uh, on one hand it can be understood in its literal meaning of red clay as a term for a family of clays that turn red after firing. At the same time, and on the other hand, it can be understood as one specific type of clay with certain properties that distinguish it from other red clays. So the terminology is going to be a bit difficult and that's probably something we're going to keep encountering over the course of this stream. <coughs> so for red clays there are two main types. First of all, we've got Hongni, like I just mentioned, the uh, specific denominator for that type of clay, rather than the name for the family of clays. And then we've got Juni. Hongni is obviously, of course, red mud in this case as well. And Juni stands for vermilion mud. Uh, this one also used to be called Hongni, however it ended up being distinguished by teapot collectors because of certain positive characteristics it uh, endows upon the tea. This uh, particular pot I have here is a modern Hongni pot, so no Juni, just regular old Hongni. Or new slash modern in this particular case. Okay, I'm gonna reboil the water and re-steep this uh, real quick before we get into more specific information about these uh, two subtypes of clay. So I'll be back in a second. Second steep is in the pot. While it's steeping, let's uh, use this bit of time to talk about Hongni, the clay, not the clay family. Hongni uh, used to be mined in the area around Huanglong Mountain, around a uh, Dingshu town. And Huanglong Mountain is like the main big place for Yixing clay. That's where almost all of the stuff used to come from. 
It's a bit different nowadays because a lot of the mining areas on Huanglong Mountain have been shut down due to environmental concerns. But if we talk about like clay rarity and stuff, uh, it's a useful metric to compare how much of it was found in that mountain. And so only about 8% of the entire Huanglongshan clay yield is Hongni, which makes it comparatively rare and once we get to Juni we're gonna see this stuff uh, becomes even rarer. The photo I've been showing this entire time here since the stream started is what the ore of Hongni clay looks like. It's got this like brownish yellow color Sometimes it can be a bit redder. You also see a few redder sections here, like in this particular bit. And Hongni ore is usually relatively hard and sandy, since it's a type of sedimentary rock. Pots that are made from this clay <coughs> usually have a shrinkage rate of about 13%. So if your pot is a certain size before firing, after firing, it, if it's made from Hongni clay, it's going to be 13% smaller. Let's take a quick look at an example photo of a typical Hongni pot. There we go. So as you can see here, it's red after firing, like red, maybe a bit brownish. I forgot about my steep and this is probably going to be over steeped, but we'll just go with it. Obviously on camera you have another example of what Hongni looks like. Uh, most of them have this kind of color. Sort of red, maybe a bit brown. But this is about what you can expect from a Hongni pot. Now. After Hongni, there's Juni. Uh, Juni is originally not from Huanglongshan, but from Zhaozhuangshan. However, it was also founded Huanglongshan, so it was also, uh, let's say, incorporated into the canon of clays that can be mined from there. Juni is quite the special clay because only a fairly tiny amount of Juni is mined every year, and just a small fraction of the entire Hongni yield of Huanglongshan is Juni, so of those 8% we talked about earlier, maybe less than 10% of that, probably even less, are Juni, which makes it a fairly rare clay. When it comes to buying Juni, uh, you need to be aware that it's a really big name. It's like probably the teapot clay poster child, if you will. Everybody knows Juni, everybody talks about it. And that, of course, means there's going to be a lot of fake Juni pots on the market. My personal recommendation would be. If you want to get one, like I said, find someone who knows his stuff and uh, or knows their stuff and trust them to help you find a decent one. But even then, finding a good Juni pot is not going to be the easiest thing in the world. So we saw the Hongni ore earlier. For comparison's sake, let's take a look at what Juni ore looks like. Here you go. So, it's probably a bit hard to see from those photos, but if we compare it to the other one we just saw before, this one is a lot softer. It also comes from soft mudstone. Another interesting difference is that Juni, unlike Hongni, is water-soluble. However, the clay it produces is fairly fragile overall. 
It has a high shrinkage rate at about 20 to 30 percent or more, depending on like the specific type of Juni. Which I think you can see here. Yeah. So this is an example of a Juni pot before and after firing. This is how much it ends up shrinking. Another issue with it is that it's a really delicate clay. It's kind of difficult to work with, and because it's so delicate, it means that a good amount of Juni pots get lost during firing. I've read somewhere that the success rate of firing a Juni pot is only about 60%. It's much higher for other types of clay. Another thing that's noteworthy about Juni that also gives it its name is that rather than the brownish red color of a Hongi pot, Juni has a more orange-ish red color, which you can see here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so Hongni, reddish brownish color, Juni, more on the orange end. Uh, there are various subtypes of Hongni and Juni out there, with one famous example being the Da Hong Pao clay, a particularly rare and intensely red Juni variant, but genuine Da Hong Pao clay is <laughs> really, really rare. Like, uh, just how Juni is a fraction of all Hongni mind, Da Hong Pao clay is only a fraction of all Juni mind. Okay. Now that we've gotten through all the basic information about these two types of clay, uh, let's answer the question that some of you at least have probably already been waiting for. What do these pots actually do? So, Hongni, compared to Juni, has a higher heat retention, but Juni has smaller pores overall. Juni usually tends to do well with aromatic teas that don't require constant high heat, whereas Hongni is more of an all-round clay that's suitable for many types of teas. Its slightly larger pores means that it is going to have a slight, let's say, rounding effect on the tea, but not as much as Zini or especially Duani. So Hongni is the type of pot you can use when you have a tea that you don't really want to change much, you just want to enjoy it as is. And maybe just make it a tiny bit rounder, if you will. Also, since regular Hongni has uh, better heat retention than Juni, it makes it a particularly good choice for uh, Shengpur, in my opinion. Because, from personal experience, uh, Sheng tends to benefit a lot from good heat retention, which is also one of the reasons why I don't like doing Sheng in most Gaiwans, because they don't retain heat very well. Of course, uh, you can have like a nice, I don't know, clay or stoneware Gaiwan with thick wa uh, walls and whatnot, but most of the time it's going to be like a porcelain Gaiwan and it's going to lose heat uh, quite quickly. And that's usually different when you use a proper clay teapot. Alright. Now that we've gotten through all of the information on this specific type of clay, uh, I'm going to do a few more steeps of this, and then we are going to move on to the next type of clay. Now, if any of you have any questions about uh, 
Hong Ni in particular, feel free to ask and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. For now I'm gonna reboil the water, so talk to you in a minute. Okay. That steep is going now. Uh, this last one was definitely over steeped. I'm feeling like a bit of dryness in my mouth. It's slightly stringent, which isn't usually the case when I uh, properly focus on making the tea and not trying to talk about a bunch of things at the same time. But honestly, it's still not too bad, like, it tasted fine, it wasn't overly bitter or anything. All in all though, I think this is gonna provide a good basis for comparison once we get to those other two plays. There should be an especially big contrast in the next, uh, teapot that I'm going to be using and that we're going to be talking about, which is Dwani. For now, however, let's just uh, take our time and enjoy this. Alright, that steep should be about ready now. So let's get that in there. Where did you get the Dwani? Uh, I got this one from a German tea vendor called Teewald. Uh, they seem to be stocking a lot of pots. I've been quite happy with it so far. It's performing the way Dwani is supposed to perform. It was only like a bit unfortunate that it ended up being way bigger than I expected. Yeah, I'm still just getting that honey sweetness, still getting the floral notes. I do feel it's gotten a bit... I don't want to say spicier, because it's more like there's more spice flavor compared to the steeps before. It also does have a bit of minerality to it. Not a lot, though. Yeah, those like, let's say, if we were talking in terms of equalizers, I'd probably say like those high frequency notes in this tea, the floral ones are quite pleasant, 
but I'll be curious to see what the T is like if those end up being toned down a bit in maybe one of the other pots. Another nice thing I've noticed about my Hongi pot in particular is uh, that, like I've mentioned before, it really helps bring out the aroma of a tea. For instance, uh, this Haiwan Mahe that I've had on a previous stream is an incredibly aromatic young Sheng tea. And for that particular reason, I really enjoy drinking it in the Hongni, because all of that, like, beautiful, lovely, fruity aroma it has comes out perfectly. Oh, hi Zelasi, how are you doing today? Oh, that's nice. Uh, you two drinking anything in particular? Also, I'm gonna reboil real quick. Alright, there we go, fourth steep is going in. We're drinking Taiwanese black tea, that's nice. I don't think I've had any Taiwanese black tea so far, but um, going by the Taiwanese oolongs I've had, I can imagine that they'd be quite pleasant. I think we're gonna do one more steep after this one in the Hongni and then we're gonna move on to Duanni. The tea definitely has more than that to give but considering that I'm drinking basically three sessions worth of tea today uh, I don't think we need to go all the way with every single one. Especially when we're trying to keep things a bit uh, more concise. Yeah, this one's definitely gonna have a VOD on YouTube to watch. I might be able to get it up tomorrow, but maybe it'll be Tuesday or so. We'll have to see. Shouldn't take too long, though. Mm. <laughs> yeah, um, I've I've got all the information I researched in uh, like a Google Doc, and I made a presentation thing for all the photos uh, on that part of the screen, and all of that is going to be available in the YouTube description probably, along with all of the sources I used 
to research this stuff. I do enjoy this tea a good amount, like, uh, generally I'll be one of the first people to say that Iwu as a region doesn't necessarily have to be, like, all light, flowery, and pleasant, but this tea definitely falls in that category, and in my personal opinion it's one of the few genuinely good examples of Iwu teas that do taste this way. Usually I tend to prefer the more powerful ones like that Mahe I already drank. But this one is definitely also quite nice. It's quite affordable too. Oh yeah, some other perhaps uh, interesting side notes since I saw people talking about altitude and whatnot today. My current elevation is 598 meters, so water boils at a temperature of 98.06 degrees here, which means I'm not doing the full 100 degree boil on my Sheng, but... I'd say 98 degrees is probably close enough. Alright, so while I've got this fifth uh, steep going, I need to refill my kettle. Oh, no, no, I have no idea what the elevation of the tea area for this tea is like. Just like the place I live in is about 600 meters above sea level. Uh, yeah, like I said, I need to refill the kettle and prepare the next session, so I'm going to be muted for a bit. But it shouldn't be too long.
Okay, uh, I've reboiled the water. I'm doing the Hongni pot now. Here's 13.5 grams of tea. Uh, I agree, Zealousy. Three sessions of tea is going to be a bit of an undertaking. I usually do like one session a day at most, which is usually around 8 grams. And just for today, I've got, uh, I think, about 30 grams of tea between these three sessions. So, uh, sleeping might end up being a bit of a struggle tonight. At the same time, that means I will uh, get to chat a bit more with all of you lovely American friends. Okay, uh, tea is in there now. Gonna reboil the water again real quick. Do the rinse, do the first steep, and then uh, I'll be back momentarily. Okay, I'm done boiling and rinsing and everything. Uh, yeah, 13.5 grams. Now, usually I'd probably go for a lot less, even if I were to do it in the Hongni, uh, in the Duani. But today I thought it might be a good idea to try to scale things linearly. So I'm doing 7 grams in the 130 milliliter Zini. I'm doing. Uh, 9.2 grams in the 170 milliliter Hongni, 
and I'm doing 13.5 in a 250ml 1E. You ran out of water and you have to change the filter. Ah, damn. That is quite unfortunate. Alright, so last bit of the Ongni. Uh, Yiwu Huangtian going in. We'll be able to compare that to the Duani in a moment since the first steep should be ready. Right about now. If I were to do this just for, like, having a fun session by myself, I'd probably use whatever I consider the, like, magic number to be on that particular tea. For most, it's somewhere around 8 grams. For this one, I'd say it's close to 10 grams, since uh, it, it just benefits from having a bit more material in there, so you get more flavor overall. I'd probably do 10 grams in the Duani and I'd only do like 4 steeps overall and have all of those be fairly long. Maybe start at around a minute and then go 2 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. But yeah, uh, let's see what this the steeped in one knee tastes like. The first thing I'm noticing right off the bat with this one is the Gongdao Bay is a lot hotter than in the Duan Ni. Uh, in the Hong Ni. Now this may be in part due to the higher volume of tea being made, due to it just being a bigger vessel, but I think it also has to do with the type of clay. So let's get into that segment, shall we? The section clays, also known as Duan Ni. Duan Ni is an umbrella term for both green clay, or Luni, and various Zisha clays, uh, clay blends that usually contain some amount of luni. It's mostly used for clay that has a beige, yellow or light brown color after firing. Duani is usually softer ores with light gray, greenish gray or even just gray colors with red or brown spots. Duani and Luni tend to have a lower iron oxide content compared to other clays, uh, around like 2 to 4%, never more than 4%. And around 12% of the entire Huanglongshan yield were considered Duani. So there's a bit more of it than there is Ongni, which was 8%. Today I'm going to be talking about four different types of Duani. There's Benshan Luni, which translates roughly to original mountain green mud. There's Benshan Duani, which is once again original mountain, but then section mud. And then there's Huangjin Duan, which is the yellow golden section. And finally there's Mo Luni, which is dark green mud. Let's start with the first one, Benshan Luni. Uh, this one is the only actual ore in this category. There are other ores that are also considered Duani, but uh, I'm mostly going to be mentioning this one for today as it's like the most important one out there. This one, much like many other clays, originally comes from Huanglong Mountain. And here you can take a look at the ore. There's also some like sample clay discs at the bottom. Uh, Benshan Luni can be anywhere from beige to yellow or even bronze after firing, depending on which temperature it was fired at. 
Uh, here you can see an example pot. This one has that beige color. And yeah, this is like the main uh, actual single ore type of one. Benchan Luni. Now, one uh, clay mix that's considered the one knee that contains Benchan Luni is so called uh, is the so-called Benchan Duan Ni. It originally referred to the Duan Ni that was mined from Huanglongshan, but is nowadays used for any type of Duan Ni that ends up having a yellow tone after firing. So technically speaking, this pot would probably be considered Benchan Duan Ni, simply because of its yellow color. Benchan Duani is usually a mix between Luni and Zini of about 85% and 15%. However, that may vary, but it's usually somewhere in that ballpark. Benchan Duani is darker than just Luni. For instance, if you compare, uh, you can see the uh, really beige pot here on this photo that I'm showing and this particular pot I have here is a fair bit darker than that. Like this one has a yellow, almost slightly brownish color. Benchan Duani is uh, also usually has a rougher and sandier texture than just Benchan Luni. This probably also comes from the Zini being mixed in there, since that tends to be a uh, slightly rougher clay in comparison to just Luni. Dwani also has the lowest iron oxide content of all the Dwani clays, and its shrinkage rate is about 12%. Here's an, uh, another example of a Benshan Dwani pot. So if you compare, this one, it might be a bit hard to see on the stream, but this one has like a slightly rougher texture than one before it. And if you take away like the way the lighting was done for both of those photos, it would end up being a bit darker. Next up, we've got another clay blend that's considered Duani, and that's Huangjin Duan. Its name comes from the golden color the teapot has after firing. Uh, I seem to be missing an image here. Give me a second. But generally speaking, Huangjin Duan is quite rare compa uh, compared to other Duani clays and clay mixtures. However, uh, as it always is with things that are rare, this one is generally considered to be the best Duani clay. And similar to Benchan Duani, its shrinkage rate is about 12 to 13 percent. All right, uh, here's the photo I was missing. Hang on, I'll pull it over here so you can see it. So if you compare those two, this one has a color that's much closer to like golden brown or even bronze compared to the other two which were closer to like a beige-ish yellow. Alright and uh, finally there's one more type of Duani that I'm going to be talking about today and that's Moluni the uh, dark green light. This one uh, as the name might imply, is known for its dark green appearance. That shade in particular uh, is actually known as the Republic of China Green. Mo Luni is supposed to be all Luni with maybe just a tiny bit of Zini added, but it will usually be some sort of clay mixture that has chromium oxide 
and or cobalt is oxide added to it as colouring agents. So the star green colour is not the natural colour of that clay. And that's, in my opinion, really important to note. Proper Moluni is safe to use. However, it's likely that there are pots out there that use potentially toxic colouring agents. So if you find one that has actually been coloured with chromium oxide or cobalt oxide, it's supposedly safe, but uh, it seems like there are replicas out there that are coloured in other ways that are anything but. And to be completely honest, since Moluni can basically be virtually any base clay that has added some, uh, has had some kind of colouring added to it. There's no real information on concrete shrinkage rates and firing rates, uh, firing temperatures, and it. I don't know. I'm I'm a bit worried of this one, and I'm a bit worried about it because um, it could be anything. It could have toxic substances added to it, and there are... it doesn't provide anything unique to the tea that other one e pots can't do. So personally I'd probably recommend just getting a standard one e pot instead. Alright. Before I uh, mention the like general properties of the one knee clays and how they affect the tea, I need to reboil this water and do another steep, so I'll be back in a moment. Alright, here we go. Second steep is uh, underway. My impressions from this first one were that it did indeed lose those like fragrant floral top notes, which does make sense. Like, out of all the Zisha clays, Dwani has the highest porosity and heat retention, which makes it the most likely to have the strongest overall effect on a tea's flavour. So if your tea has some flavours that need to be toned down, think like strong roast flavours, or maybe some smokiness, maybe some intense storage notes, uh, and they benefit from a pot that holds heat for a long time, Dwani should do a good job. At the same time, however, because of these properties, it's not too well suited for delicate or subtle teas, and the high porosity might remove those subtle notes in various teas, or those more delicate ones, like the, the high frequency notes, so to speak. And that's kind of the impression I'm getting here, like... Where this tea was... Flowers, honey, and spice before, with maybe a bit of greenness. It's more just like... Maybe it sounds weird, but it's, it's more just like honey soup now, in a way. It kind of removed almost anything other than that honey note. There's maybe still a like touch of greenness in the aftertaste. And... Maybe there's going to be a bit more spice or something in those further steeps, but for now, 
this uh, mostly just tastes of honey now. It's nice and thick, and I do like that honey flavor, but it has lost a fair bit of complexity compared to what it was like in the Homni. I would say it's also a bit less aromatic overall, like where Hongni helps to bring out the aromatics of a tea that already is aromatic, this one will also tone them down, like if I smell this now, the smell isn't as strong if you will, as it was in the Hongni. And not all of the aroma notes are really coming through. But yeah, the heat retention on this pot is just off the chart, like... Even now, when I touched it, those uh, few minutes after doing the second steep, uh, it still felt like it had the same temperature that it did when there was boiling water inside. I'm not sure if I really should be doing five steeps in this one because it produces a lot of tea thanks to being 250 milliliters and all. Um, I'm definitely going to do at least one more and then we'll see after that. So, I'd say that this combination, like a uh, Dwani pot and an aromatic delicate young sheng is something that would generally be considered unconventional. And I also personally agree that it's not like what you'd be going for most of the time when enjoying a younger Sheng tea. But if you're looking for a particular experience, like the uh, honey soup thing I just described with this tea, then it can do that quite well. Mm. I've also noticed a similar thing in some of the green teas I've tried in this Guan pot, where of course they end up being less complex overall, but they just produce a really pleasant tasting tea.
So I guess if we're speaking in terms of equalizers and frequencies and whatnot, then Dwani is probably the type of pot that accentuates the like medium level of frequencies. And it cuts out a lot of the like higher end, probably some of the bottom end as well. And it just tries to present a an experience that's smooth overall. It's sort of like uh, easy listening, but for tea, if you will. Alright, uh, I've got the third steep going now. Just gonna enjoy more of this. I would feel a bit bad only doing three steeps uh, with this much tea being used, so I might go for more. And despite it not being particularly complex right now, it is really pleasant to drink. To those of you watching, are you drinking anything right now? Or did you have anything today? about ready. To be honest, I haven't been drinking that much tea this week, because right now I'm waiting for this uh, big tea mall shipment to arrive, and I'm really excited to try all of that stuff, probably going to do some streams on that as well. And I really just wanted to get here already so I can start trying everything and giving my opinion on it. I'm. Hoping to have some good stuff in there, but as always, 
but as always with Tmall, it is a bit of a gamble. Okay, um, already starting to sweat a bit from this tea, and we're only like halfway through everything, so tonight is definitely going to be fun. Adam, how are you doing? Are you drinking anything? This pot is still, like, scorching hot. Some unroasted Chie Guan Yin. Did you enjoy it? Okay, uh, I'm doing a fourth and final steep of this now, and then we are going to be moving on to Tsini. Which is probably the thing most of you were looking forward to since uh, people were interested in hearing about what uh, King T Mall teapots are like. So, I got one because it fits my uh, it fit my parameters of what I was looking for, and we will find out what it's gonna be like quite soon. Ah, it was just okay. Yeah, to be fair, I do feel like it's not that easy for green oolong to be like really good because most of the time especially when it comes to Chie Guan Yin you kind of get these like flower bombs that border on being unpleasant because of how like intense they are that's been my experience at least and I'm sure some people enjoy that but it's not for me. I prefer it when there's a bit more flavor balance, so to speak. Like when there's one tea that's 12 out of 10 on one note and then doesn't have much else going on. Uh, 
I probably wouldn't like that one as much as one that has a, a bunch of different flavor notes all at maybe like an 8 out of 10. Okay, while this fourth steep is finishing up, uh, I will briefly mute myself once again to refill my water. And I'll be back in a moment. Also has been refilled. Uh, I'm gonna reboil this in a bit. I'm gonna finish this uh, other steep first. What is my accent? Um, so, I'm German. I grew up speaking German and learning English for the most part. And my accent I'd say was mostly formed from being friends with a bunch of Welsh people and playing thousands of hours of Dota with them. But I mean, there's definitely a bunch of German left in there. I guess it is roughly in like British-ish territory though. What do you think about this tea? Uh, the one I'm drinking right now? So, uh, I have a decent amount of experience with this tea. Overall, it's a fairly delicate and pleasant tea to drink. Like, it uh, has mainly floral notes, it has a lot of honey going on, a bit of, and then like a bit of spice and that typical light herbaceousness you can get from Sheng. It's a nice tea, but uh, overall, it's quite good for the price, in my opinion. And the reason I chose it for today's, like, clay comparison is precisely because it's so delicate. Like, a bunch of the flavors it have can get lost in a pot that is more muting. So, I think it's a good example to showcase how these different types of clay affect the tea in various ways. So, we first did it in Hongni which uh, made it stay fairly true to its original character. It had all of those things I described earlier. Whereas now in Duanyi, it's... Uh, I described it as honey soup. It just really... It tastes of honey with not a lot of else going on and it's nice and thick. Which is really enjoyable, but very different from the way it tasted in the Hongni pot. And if you're looking for something that's complex and not just really pleasant to drink, then Hongni would probably be the better option between those two for this particular tea. But if you're if you're just looking for something nice that goes down well, then uh, Dwani can do a decent job here. And on that note, I'm gonna start reboiling. I'm gonna get this zini pot ready. 
and then we are going to talk about some purple clays. Alright, I preheated the pot, uh, here are the leaves for this session. This is 7 grams of that Yiwu Huangtian. It's got some nice, like, leaves and twigs in there, like, <laughs> look at this one. And then, oh, um, then this kind of stuff. All sorts of goodness. This one in particular is gonna be a bit difficult to cram into this pot, but we'll manage.
Right, uh, I've got the rinse going there. Shouldn't take too long, and then we can do the first steep and talk about some purple clay. <sighs> this tea was definitely nice and one -y. I think I enjoyed drinking it that way, and I might do it again in the future if I'm looking for, like, specifically this experience. And, like I said at the start of the stream, uh, that's probably one of the things I want to communicate with this. Don't, like, get into that headspace of wanting to only use a particular type of pot or clay with a particular type of tea. There are lots of experiences out there that you can make if you uh, combine certain clay teapots with certain teas that are unlocked by not having a set of preconceived notions about what needs to go where or how something needs to work in particular. And even if it's not the norm, some of these experiences can be quite pleasant, and there can be spots where that is exactly the right thing. So, whenever you make tea, or whenever you decide what, which tea to have and how to make it, consider that these unusual options also exist. I'm just rinsing out my equipment here. The first steep is uh, already going. Should be mom uh, ready any moment. Yeah, it, it used to be quite similar for me. Like, um, when I... The first teapot I, like, really bought was actually this Hongni, and it is a really good pot, and it works really well for the types of tea I drink, which really is just young to not too heavily aged Cheng. So I've been happy with it for a long time, but uh, there comes the point where you wonder if there aren't, like, different ways of experiencing the same teas. And, uh, I sometimes recall a conversation I used to have with, uh, Broto from the Tea Discord. Where, uh, it was basically like, when you buy a new teapot, you basically buy, uh, an entirely different way of experiencing the teas you already have. So rather than like buying one new tea, uh, when you get a new tea, if you get a new teapot instead, you get like, I don't know, 20 new experiences with the teas that are already in your collection. Obviously now if you own multiple teapots, when you buy one new tea, you also don't just buy one new experience, you buy like, I don't know, five or maybe 10 new experiences by having that particular tea in all of these pots that you own.
Okay, and here's the first steep. Uh, can you tell me about your cup or pitcher? They look pretty nice. So, this one is uh, just some random cup from Yunnan Sourcing. I think it was maybe like 8 euros for two. Pretty cheap, but it's a nice, like, everyday cup to use. I'm not sure if they still have them, but uh, definitely take a look there and see if you can find it. Uh, this picture, on the other hand, was commissioned by uh, a vendor and now real-life acquaintance of mine. Uh, he's called Gabriele, he runs a German tea shop called Nanwoshan. They specialize in like various high-end teas, he often flies out to China multiple times a year to source stuff. And one of the things they started doing now is commissioning teaware on top of uh, sourcing their own teas. So this is one of the first things they commissioned. And it looks really nice. It fits my teapots well, which was also one of the reasons I got it. And I've been really happy with it overall. I also have a uh, Gaiwan that was commissioned from the same uh, studio, which is this one. However, uh, I got this one for free because uh, it was broken when it arrived. As you can see, like there's some stuff missing here, so it can't be sold. And then I, uh, I decided to take it off him instead of like having it go into the trash. Because this one, just by itself, is also really nice for like doing grandpa-style green teas, for instance. Uh, the pitcher does pour really well, which is another nice thing about it, like, it it doesn't really have stuff dribbling down here. And it's it has a good pour speed, uh, you shouldn't go too fast, because then it can spill uh, on the sides, but... Like, we're talking too fast, like, basically going like this. So, all in all, it works really nicely. It, handles well, and one of the few thing, uh, nice things about this one in particular is that I'm left-handed. A lot of the other uh, pictures from that same run of commissions had this indentation on the other side, so you could grab it with your right hand and uh, it would fit your thumb nicely. This was, I think, one of two that were done this way with the indentation on the other side, which means it actually handles really well when I use it with my left hand. Which, to be honest, doesn't happen too often. But yeah, uh... I'm already drinking this first steep, so it's high time we got into the final clay of this evening. The one that uh, my new teapot is also made from, which is... The family of purple clay is also known as Zini. Uh, purple clay is the most common type of Zisha, and uh, around 80% of the Huanglong mountain yield would be considered Zini. It refers to a big family of various clays with roughly the same properties rather than one specific clay. Zini usually has a higher iron oxide content than Hongni and Duanyi, which people assume partially leads to it being this purple color that you can see on here. After firing, the uh, color of Zini can range from like a dark pig liver type red to purple or even a dark brown, depending on the temperature it was fired at. The shrinkage rate of Zini is quite low compared to other Yixing clays, at usually well below 10%. Today I'm going to be focusing on one specific type 
of teeny clay and one label that is usually assigned to teapots made with that clay. The type of clay I'm going to be talking about is De Sao Ching, which roughly translates to bottom trough, 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 mud, and Ching Shui Ni, which is clear water mud. That's the label. Now, when it comes to De Sao Ching, it's probably the most famous Zini variant. Usually, it's found when mining other Zini. And it, its name comes from being found at the bottom of the trenches that miners would dig out to mine the ore. One easy way to identify this particular type of clay is by the chicken eyes it has. So if you look at this picture, there's this like purple mud in the background, and then there's the spots of like greenish, grayish stuff on there. Those are the chicken eyes that are used to identify this particular type of clay. Uh, what these are is that they are like uh, a discoloration that's caused by having lower amounts of oxidized iron in those specific spots. Now, let's take a look at some example pots. First of all, we've got these two, which is uh, De Sao Ching Zini at the lowest firing temperature and at a medium firing temperature. The first one, as you can see, is this sort of uh, dark pig liver, that's what it's called, type bread, and a more of a purplish brownish color. On top of those two, I also have another example, which is this one, which has like a clear dark brown color, and that's usually what Zini looks like when it's fired at the highest possible temperature. Now, let's talk a bit about Ching Shui Ni. Originally, this referred to a specific type of clay. It also used to be known as Hong Zini or Pu Ni, which uh, translates to standard clay. This clay was commonly found and used for flower pots before tea drinkers started to appreciate its qualities as a teapot clay, and supplies of other ores started dwindling sometime in the 80s. Nowadays, Ching Shui Ni refers uh, or serves more as a quality label for teapots made from various types of Zini. The reason being that a lot of Zini pots today have additives in their clay to help out with like their looks and various properties. This is something we saw before with like dyes being added to make the clay look a certain way, etc. Uh, new Ching Shui Ni designates that nothing other than Zisha ore and water was used to make the clay. So, no additives whatsoever. That's sort of the promise the teapot maker is giving by adding that label to their teapot. And if you're getting a modern teapot with that label, uh, you can usually expect it to not be this uh, old type of clay, or older type of clay, but rather some form of purple clay that didn't have anything added to it.
Alright, second steep is going... Uh, before I get into talking about this specific pot, I'm gonna mention some like general properties of Zini clays. Zini serves as sort of the middle ground between Hongni and Duani. It's more porous than Hongni, but less than Duani. Its heat retention is quite good overall, and it also falls like somewhere in the middle between Hongni and Duani. This means that Zini is a great all-round material, maybe even more so than like the general Hongni. Much like in Duanni, some minor subtleties might be lost when drinking this tea, or very like delicate teas in general, but overall it should help produce a nice and well-rounded tea. Like if you have a particular tea and you feel like a Duanni pot is removing too many of its subtleties, but you would like it to be round, rounder overall than it would be in something entirely neutral or something that only has very slight muting properties, then Zini is probably the way to go. Like for instance, if, if you have a tea that you feel is just a bit too strongly roasted, then it might be better to try Zini before going straight to Duanni for that one. Second steep going in. Mm. So yeah, compared to what this tea was like in Duani, uh, a lot more of those subtleties that uh, went missing are back. So now uh, it, it does have some floral notes again. It still tastes quite strongly of honey. Uh, the spice notes are also back. And maybe one interesting property here is that the herbaceousness of this tea is a bit stronger than in the other two. I can't really explain why that would be the case, but that's kind of the impression I'm getting and that's something I've also noticed when drinking other teas in this particular pot. I mean, as long as they're decent pots, having more pots is uh, not a bad idea. It's definitely fun to have like a wider range of experiences you can produce with the stuff you have. Yeah, this one's definitely also hotter than the Hongni, but I'd say not quite as extreme as the Duanyi. Like, this one's a bit easier to touch in comparison. Mm. It does still produce a fairly round tea. But it's already it's it's by no means as extreme as the one. -y. Yeah, to be honest, I've. Uh, I've also been asked the question of why do you need this many teapots by various people and uh, I mean maybe having this video will help provide an answer to that question.
one thing I am noticing here is that the tea seems a bit maybe juicier in a way. Like uh, where the the second steep in the Hongni was a bit like astringent and mouth drying because I oversteeped it. Uh, this one is kind of mouth watering in comparison. That steep is going now. So, about this pot in particular. Some of the people on the tea discord were interested in what it was going to be like. Uh, I've talked about the qualities of Zini in general. So far, I think this tea has been doing, uh, this teapot has been doing a fine job. It definitely fits the expectation one would have of a Zini pot. Uh, craftsmanship wise, it's quite well made. Uh, after I pour this steep, I can maybe try to show like the lid fit and stuff. I already briefly showed the uh, what happens when I cover the air hole at the top, the pour does stop for a bit. So it does create a pretty tight seal. Um, I definitely haven't noticed any like off odors or flavors in this one. It seems quite clean overall. It does do some muting, but not too much. I haven't had much experience with other Zini pots, so I can't say whether this one in particular is like as muting as they should be, or if it's not muting enough. But I'm sure that's gonna come with time. Overall, there definitely is a muting effect. It definitely does affect the properties of the tea overall, not just in terms of flavor, but also structurally, so to speak. And honestly, I really can't complain. How did you prep the pot when it arrived? Uh, the first, first thing I did was to rinse it under hot water a bunch of times like maybe for a few minutes total. And after I did that, I uh, boiled some water and I put that in there and I repeated uh, and let it sit a bit. And like I uh, poured boiling water on top of it. And I repeated that process three times in total. I definitely didn't let it soak or anything like that. It already looked fairly clean when it arrived, like not a lot of dust and whatnot going on. So it, uh, I didn't feel like it needed a really thorough cleaning.
Oh yeah, uh, now that I've poured the steep, uh, let's take a closer look at this pot. So, uh, the first thing to note is that it has a really long lid skirt, and that probably contributes to the tightness of the seal. It also has a, like, really tight lid fit overall. There's really basically zero wiggle room here. And sometimes when you've got a bit of water on there and you put it in and then you turn it around a bit and wait, you can actually turn the pot upside down and the lid is gonna stay on. So yeah, really tight fit there. Uh, it pours quite well. Like, um, it doesn't really do much dribbling or anything like that. Nothing ever comes out at the top here, thanks to the tight seal. And the stream here is quite uh, consistent, so to speak. Which means it also has a decently fast pour time. Another thing that's good for me personally about this teapot is that I can actually use it with one hand. I do have fairly small hands, so for instance, if I try to use this Hongni pot with one hand, it's it's already kind of tough to get to the uh, the knob up here without having my finger touch the scorchingly hot teapot. So I usually have to use two hands like this when I handle this one, and I mean it's even worse for this one. Like I can barely get my finger up here, but it doesn't feel stable at all. So it's nice to have this one be at a size where I can comfortably just do this with one hand. Uh, Broto, if you're still here, I know you also have a Zini. What kind of, like, qualities or effects do you uh, notice when you make tea in yours? That steep is in, by the way. I'm probably gonna do five of this one, so two more after this. It's also nice, uh, definitely a fair bit closer to the way it was in Hongni compared to the way it was in the Guanni. Overall, I actually kind of feel like my favorite session of this tea today was with the Dwani. I hadn't done this tea in it before and it was so like significantly different from the other two that it just felt really unique and just having a tea that tastes of uh, basically just honey was fun. Yeah. 
that's probably the best way to describe it. Maybe, like, tea doesn't always have to be perfect when the way you experience it can also just be fun. Like, this is probably not something I would do at a tea tasting session where people have certain expectations to what a tea is going to be like. Unless, of course, they want to try specifically that. But it... It produced a way to enjoy this particular tea that I hadn't associated with it before. Yours is a, an early 90s dark zini. You agree with my general summary of it rounding and being low to moderate commuting? Yeah, I've heard that Jamshui can perform kind of similarly to Hongni, where it doesn't mute much overall. I I have heard there might be a bit of a difference in heat retention when it comes to Hongni and Jamshui, so I might have to get one at some point to compare that. It reduces roast and storage nodes without completely getting rid of them. Yeah. Yeah, that that is how I feel about Zini overall. Like it's suited for teas that you want to take the edge off of, but where well, you don't want to lose much overall. If we go back to like the Duani comparison, uh Duani took a lot out of the tea, whereas Zini just muted some specific aspects of it to produce a more well-rounded experience overall. Whereas Duani really, like, produced an effect that seemed like it changed the actual composition of the tea, if that makes sense. Overall, I'm definitely happy with this uh, Zini pot. Um, I think if you're interested in buying a pot on King T Mall, you should probably send John a message and uh, have him help you figure out what exactly you want to go for. I do trust his opinion on a lot of stuff and uh, so far, every interaction I've had with him, and everything I've bought from him, has been quite nice. No pails? I'm not sure. Welcome to the stream. Are you someone from the Discord? Yeah, Crimson Lotus is probably where I'd go for some Janshui. Um, maybe I'll be able to get a pot that's actually 120 milliliters. Instead of the 130 milliliters I got with my Zini. Now, 
I'm perfectly fine with it being 130 milliliters, but uh, having one that's just a tiny bit smaller would also be nice. Ah, oh, I see. Well, uh, the stream is probably not going for much longer, but I uh, hope you're going to have a good time on here. Hundred and nineteen milliliter. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. I do kind of wonder what this, uh, the like shrinkage rate of Jamshui clay is like. So maybe at some point in the future, there's going to be a follow-up stream where I do like uh, Jamshui niching and Purion or something like that. Could be kind of fun, but uh, I'd have to get all of those pots first, and that's definitely going to take a while. Especially considering that I also want to buy more tea in the meantime. Yeah, to be honest, from what people are describing uh, about Purion, it does seem like the kind of clay that would be perfectly suited for what I'm doing. Which is just like intensely aromatic younger Sheng. So I would like to give it a try at some point. Whew. I'm also really sweating now from all of this tea. Uh, after I'm done with this, it's definitely gonna have been enough tea for today. And just like enough liquid volume too as well, to be honest. Because I did like bought five steeps in 170 milliliters, then four steeps in 250 milliliters, and now I'm doing five steeps in 130 milliliters. When I'd usually only be doing one of those three. So I guess you can say that uh Salvation awaits in the bathroom after this stream is done. Okay, I started the final steep a bit early now, I'm hoping to get uh, like a nice and strong steep to finish this stream. We had a lot of tea today, we had a bunch of different clays, uh, hopefully some useful information for you all. And even if you can't do a lot with the information, I hope you at least uh, had a good time on here watching me drink tea and talk about a bunch of stuff.
Nice. Really nice. At this point, there's probably not a lot left to say about the topics for this stream. So, we're just gonna enjoy some tea here and uh, let things slowly fade out. This tea is definitely relaxing in a way, at least uh, when I'm drinking this much of it. I don't usually notice much of an effect from this one, which I guess contributes to my impression of it being quite delicate overall, or quite soft maybe, but uh, after drinking this much of it, I'm definitely noticing this feeling of relaxation coupled with a fair bit of sweating just from drinking so much hot liquid. But honestly, I expect it to be a bit more maybe exhausted at the end of this stream. And that's really not the case. Right. Let's see what this final steep is like. What this uh, evil Huang Tian has left to give. Five steeps, seven grams, 130 milliliter Zini pot. Steep time, I don't know. That's something you will probably know better than me, to be honest. Yeah, this one's a bit stronger than the last one. Which is how I enjoy this particular tea. I do like that it can be bold if you get like the right ratio and the right steep times. When you're a bit more aggressive than you'd be with most other teas, so to speak. It's definitely a good tea to showcase that you can't really generalize that much. And even if you have your, like, go-to ratios and steep times fairly set in stone, there are gonna be a number of teas that will be better if you do them a bit differently and if you go out of your comfort zone, so to speak.
And since I already mentioned fun earlier, it's probably good to bring up here again. Experimenting with all of these things uh, cannot just be useful for, like, optimizing the way you can enjoy a particular tea. It's also a lot of fun. Like, if you keep doing a particular tea differently until you find what you consider the optimal way to do it, you're gonna have different experiences every time, and different notes and aspects of the tea are gonna come out differently. Which, I guess, also ties into this whole idea of experimenting with different clays. Don't just do that, you can also experiment with different ratios, different steep times. Different waters, even, if you want to do that. There are so many small, like, knobs you can turn and twist when it comes to making tea. And... There's a lot of fun to be had in turning and twisting those knobs. And on that note, I'm pouring the final cup of this session. I will uh, end the stream in a bit. Thank you all for joining me. A special thanks to fellow Tea Discord moderator Ije for helping me check my sources, and to Jay from Tea Life Hong Kong for fact checking the notes for this stream. Also, uh, special thanks to Mud and Leaves, since many of the images I used for today's stream were taken from their blog posts. If you're interested in the specific sources I used to put all of this together, the recording on YouTube will contain a link to everything I used in its description. Both the uh, notes for the stream, the presentation I put together with all of the images, and the actual sources of the articles, etc. I used to put this together. For now, thank you all for watching. I hope you'll have an enjoyable day or night, wherever you may be, and I will see you all on the next stream, where we're hopefully gonna drink some of those teas I ordered off Timor. Goodbye.